Well, I gave up recording this last night in the middle of the night because I was too scared of waking my neighbours up. But hello everyone, today it's 8 o'clock, we're going to be doing some Q&A. I asked you on the previous episode to go out and out and give me a lot more questions, a lot of good ones, and holy hell did you all pull through. I got an absolute ton, so if yours doesn't appear today, please don't be scared to just repost the question in the comments down below and maybe you'll get in next week. But thanks so much guys, it was brilliant to see the massive outpouring questions. A lot of it is stuff that I've answered many, many times over, particularly when you include the stream content I do, which are essentially just very long Q&As a lot of the time. But still, I've tried to uh, worm my way through them and find some interesting topics up for us. So, let's just get straight on in. Brother Gilbert starts us off by saying, WP, don't you think it's finally time that they add a proper quest system? Oh, guys, it's this topic. My favorite, right? He says, I don't like that quest-like achievements are being buried in the clunky and bloated achievement user interface rather than being given to us by NPCs. Also, the collections UI is just not structured or ordered enough to tell stories effectively. I would prefer a quest system that is driven by dialogue, has map markers as needed, makes use of story instances, etc. The new Druid back piece collection was fun, but I kind of felt like I was just aimlessly collecting items to fit a collection rather than working with the druids to gain their favor and craft slash grow the back piece. The collection system just doesn't allow for a lot of dialogue to explain why you're doing what you're doing. Another huge flaw of collections is that they can only be completed once per account, whereas quests would have the potential to be repeatable just like Living Story. What do you think? Well, what you've touched on here, Brother Gilbert, is a fairly old topic for me. You can find videos of mine three and a half, maybe even four years back, the very first year of release for Guild Wars 2, identifying that there is this gap with this game. It's an interesting topic in a lot of ways because Guild Wars 2 was set to push away from traditional MMO design in so many ways, and a big one that they pinned a lot of their hopes on was dynamic events, really. That was the huge main innovation uh, for Guild Wars 2, especially when you look at a lot of the other innovations and things they were doing were kind of already there in GW1. It was dynamic events. And so to put dynamic events in and then also say, oh, but we're also going to do traditional questing too, I think might have been a mistake in those early days. It might have m made the devs feel comfortable to lean on traditional quests too much when it was this big new thing that they were actually going for. And to this day, we haven't seen them put a proper proper, very traditional, very, uh, you know, kind of bland quest system in the game, even though it may have a lot of use. I kind of fall on your side of this discussion very much. I think and agree wholeheartedly with pretty much everything you said. I don't like that they're only once per account. I don't like that they're buried within achievement user phase. I don't think that they're always... Uh, very well implemented, though sometimes they have been impressing me, and recently more so than uh, ever before. Stuff like the Khaled Bog chain we saw with the current events was really cool. Um, so maybe there is space one day for the devs to look at this and put it in, uh, but I'm doubtful that they ever will, just because it's ingrained so deeply into this whole thing of what Guild Wars 2 is supposed to be about, and in a lot of ways, Guild Wars 2 might feel like a failure on some level if it ultimately has to implement this after all these years of fighting it. I don't think having both systems is equivalent to turning your back completely on dynamic events. I just think the best of both worlds comes from having, well, both worlds. But that may not be an opinion shared by everyone, obviously. Since I just mentioned the uh, Khaled Bog quest as well, some of you guys might be thinking, well, yeah, that was good, but we haven't really seen anything. It doesn't seem like the current events team have able to put stuff out so fast. Uh, and also, before the Khaled Bog quest chain, we also had the Shadow Stone stuff, which was also really cool, and had those even branches and things in the story, which is still kind of stalled for current events. I would say it might not be that their format is that hard or bad to deliver. It seems like, uh, having a close look at what that Shaman's been saying on Twitter, it seems like the current events team might have actually been working on this PvP patch, funnily enough. And if that seems weird to you guys, it's, if you recall in the most recent AMA, clear that now the developers have all of the festival decorations for the various maps like Lion's Arch always there now and they will can toggle them on and off without having to push new builds and things which is good for them for the future of all festivals in Guild Wars 2. The current events team are working on festivals too and the new PvP lobby as that shaman says actually has all of the Winter's Day decorations and all of the Halloween decorations on it already. So it might not be that the Khaled Bog style stuff is going away or that they need to refine it or they need to add loads of new user interface like this question from Brother Gilbert kind of beginning at. It might just be that the current events team were weirdly taken away for a PvP patch for a while. And isn't that a funny thing to think about? 
Moving on, we got Guild Wars 2 Killer B, and I do have a lot of questions today, guys, so I'm trying to uh, rush through them a bit quicker than maybe I normally would. Killer B says, hey WP, I have played this game since vanilla, and I was wondering, what do you think about replacing waypoints with bullet trains? I think it would be amazing if instead of boring loading screens, you see these beautiful cutscenes of your character on the train going from one zone to another without a loading screen. I think it would add so much immersive content instead of going from waypoint to waypoint to waypoint endlessly in loading screens. In my honest opinion, get rid of all waypoints and a surrogate and add bullet train system. Then it also makes it harder to get around. It would add so much. Anyways, I don't get answered ever. So you don't have to feature this in the Q&A. Just mention it in the stream time sometime. Well, there you go. Uh, I think that's the greatest feature I've ever heard. Possibly better even than the much more uh, realistic request of having waypoint animations sold in the gem store. Yeah, bullet trains all over Guild Wars 2. I like it. That doesn't that doesn't shit on the lore in any way. Mick F says, hey, hey Woody, how much of the Tyrion story has now been written by ArenaNet? Do the writers have a projected story after the complete next expansion, including Living World? Do they know the Guild Wars 2 finale slash transition to Guild Wars 3? Have they already formed Guild Wars 3's narrative? How deep could leaks go? So you've touched on a lot of things that are really, really, really interesting to me. And it's funny, I think it might just be a bit of a joke or a coincidence. I've been getting asked a lot about an idea of a Guild Wars 3 recently and it is a fun thing to ponder about for so many reasons in terms of arena net as a company in terms of what it means to uh, develop for an mmo and then do a sequel to an mmo and then of course all the story ideas that come out of that as well one of the other things i often get asked like nearly all the time most q a's this question will appear there most streams some will ask something similar is i get asked hey wp if you could get an absolute 100 percent answer from a developer on any topic in the law what would it be People ask me that question all the time and usually I don't have too good of an answer for them because a lot of the stories I'm really interested in the lore, frankly, I don't know whether the devs even have firm answers for topics like, as I mentioned in a very recent Q&A, Baltech, right? However, I think the best answer to that question actually is what you're saying, Mikef, and that is I would probe ArenaNet about future story that we know is coming. I would ask them something like, hey, how does season four end? Because, yeah, there is that question of how far have ArenaNet gone? And I do think they have firm answers, obviously for the end of season three, which is one episode away, obviously for the next expansion, including the start of it, the middle of it, and the end of it. And then we get to season four. Do you guys think that the developers have penned out in quite specific terms season four? I'm sure they've already got the major story beats in place, right? And then what about after season four? Do they have the major story beats in place for how the third expansion triggers? How the third expansion ends? Has season five been planned? And how far into the future do we go? I think they've probably got major story beats through at least season five. And so if I was going to ask, if I was going to get the big details, the big plans, which may be subject to change, I would probably ask for, you know, details on Expansion 3 story-wise, or, or, yeah, maybe even Season 5, something like that. Uh, really, really interesting. On the idea of that kind of stuff getting leaked, well, obviously, the further you go into the future, the more likely it is that they can change things if stuff was leaked and... It never manifests in the end. Very similar to how the end of season one was leaked and then we saw some quick changes uh, perhaps in response to that. Like Marjorie may have even died if there hadn't been a leak. That's really weird to think about. Talking about alternate timelines, that would be a very weird one, right? Moving on. We got Foxley, who says, Hey WP, what do you think about the general direction of the story now that Living World Season 3 is almost over? I don't mean the new expansion on the horizon, but after. Where do you think Guild Wars 2 is headed story-wise in the future? Also, any ideas on new Central Tyrion Masteries? So, this is kind of um, the sister question to what Mick asked a second ago. Yeah, so where are we going with the story now? Here's my thinking, especially when we think of the Guild Wars 3 thing too. To me, Guild Wars 2 is the story of the Elder Dragons. And I don't know whether I've just been influenced very heavily by the Guild Wars 2 logo, which is that dragon thing, but that is what how I feel. I feel that Guild Wars 1 was much more the story of humans and various nations back then, and, and much less well-defined, possibly, especially when you include Eye of the North. If you don't look at Eye of the North, maybe you can sum Guild Wars 1 up as, like, 
all to do with Abaddon, that even some of that's quite very thin bridges connecting everything, right? Just very small side quests that toe the line. But uh, when I think of Guild Wars 2, I do. I think Elder Dragons. And so where is the story going in general? I think that for as long as we're in Guild Wars 2 as a product, I feel like we should be dealing with Elder Dragons, really. And I kind of feel like the day that we see the last Elder Dragon die is the day that Guild Wars 2 starts straying from Guild Wars 2's story territory. And I feel like if we were ever going to move on and have a sequel or have some situation where Guild Wars 2 continues to be developed as an MMO, but then they maybe expand the IP and have other games, but they're not MMOs, so they don't like cannibalize their own audience or whatever. If they ever end up doing that, if there ever is a Guild Wars 3, whether it's called Guild Wars 3 or called anything else, just the Tyria Chronicles, I think that those stories wouldn't be dealing with the Elder Dragons. I think Guild Wars 2 is Elder Dragon territory, and it might start to lose a lot of focus the second we get out of that. You know, I've often talked about the idea of the IP going to a place where the Elder Dragons are no more, because I haven't ever really found them very convincing antagonists. Uh, but when, as much as I'd like to see the game get to that place, or get the world to that place, I don't know whether I want to see that in this product. I think Guild Wars 2 maybe should stay as Elder Dragon stuff. It's a really interesting question. I don't claim to have all the answers, and I'd love to hear what you guys think in response to this down below. Foxley also hit us with a double whammy, of course. He said, any ideas on new Central Tyrion Masteries? Uh, we kind of off the cuff conceived a very interesting one the other day. Um, cause Central Tyrion Masteries for me, I really feel like Masteries only work if you actually build content that requires Masteries to interface with them, right? Like, gliding wouldn't have worked unless they built the maps to really pressure gliding and have ley lines and have updrafts. Mushrooms wouldn't have worked unless we had maps with mushrooms, right? A lot of the enemy based ones wouldn't have worked unless we had enemies that you could then interact with the masteries. Uh, and so the problem with the Corteria masteries with Heart of Thorns was they didn't do any of that. They didn't build any bespoke content for those masteries. They just kind of slapped on and it let, meant that the Corteria masteries were really flavorless, really bland, not the greatest things in the world. I talked about this a lot in my review. I'm not a fan of the Corteria masteries at all. And so yeah, how would they do a new Corteria Mastery? Well, if they don't have the time, the budget, the resources to do that bespoke stuff, what could they band-aid slap over the top and it would feel somewhat alright? I like the idea of some kind of a, and this might sound a bit poo at first, but bear with me, a potion box. So we all know that a function of Corteria are these potions you can get through crafting, through dungeon rewards, through just straight up buying, right? And they give you incrementally stronger or weaker, depending on what tier you're going for, uh, extra damage and damage resistance against specific types of enemies. Those potions are cool. I think that's an interesting part of the game. Now they take the utility slot. If the potions were changed to be like a slot of their own, which is essentially power creep for Corteria, for what it's worth. Not that Corteria really hasn't much challenge in it at the moment. But if they did that, you could have some kind of Corteria mastery that affects those potions, affects your acquisition of those potions, gives you a box. So you know how we have a gliding mastery where we build a glider? Maybe you could build a box that is essentially account-bound inventory slots that all your characters can always access to drink potions and maybe, uh, you know, you can have auto-drinking and stuff like that. I don't know. The power creep obviously is a little bit undesirable, but I think that would be interesting for a Corteria mastery. There's lots of fun ways that they could do that. I think of PoE flasks and stuff like that, and that could be fun. So that's just off the cuff there. Uh, okay, so moving on finally. Boktor666 says, WP, first of all, kudos on the music. Xenoblade Chronicles is incredibly awesome. I swear, guys, I get way too much credit on these videos for the music. As you all know, I just use a compilation. Uh, second, I would love to hear about your world building process. Was, is this your job or was this mainly your hobby? Oh my god, I can't believe I was just asked if that was my job. I think that if world building was your job, that's probably one of the greatest jobs any human could have. How awesome would that be? And it is actually something you can do. It'd just be very rare and difficult to get that kind of work very exclusively. No, world building was a hobby and a hobby I barely scratched the surface of. Um, that's not to say I didn't do much of it. I feel like I did do a reasonable amount. I'd like to get back to it quite soon. But uh, world building is one of these things. It's, it's an endless well of crazy, fulfilling interest and intrigue and learning that you can go into. That really is endless. So I feel like I'm, you know, right at the top, uh, barely skin deep, and there's so many wonderful and fantastic things to do. My main problem uh, with world building, which I think that a lot of people end up struggling with, was actually a weird one, but it's one of documentation, and it's one of cataloging. 
Um, when you start world building, you're probably just writing with pen and paper in a journal or you're writing notepad documents or Word documents or Google Drive stuff. And that might all seem good at first, but the more you get into it, the more unwieldy things become. Like crazy unwieldy. And all of a sudden, you end up spending a lot more time thinking about, oh god, I need to restructure everything from the top down, otherwise this is just gonna get crazy. I think the best way really to do it is host your own personal wiki. But by the time I figured that out, I was way too deep in and it kind of, I don't know, it sort of bogged me down a bit. But yeah, absolutely incredible stuff. My main philosophy when it came to world building was, uh, I like the idea that anyone can world build it. World building for the uncreative. World building guided purely through geography and scientific principles that inspire you um, and make you creative just by looking at the way that the real world works. Like, great example, if you're trying to build a fantasy world and you don't know what kind of interesting beasts and creatures you want to populate it with, literally look at historic extinct animals that existed on Earth, the stuff that existed in various areas, and I'm not talking just dinosaurs, but all kinds of interesting mammals and insects and giant birds and stuff that we know have existed in the real world. Take that stuff, tweak it slightly, make it your fantasy creature and it's exciting and it's cool and it feels so much realer because it's based in something that's actually very near to life. Anyway, I will not ramble about that too much. Interesting question though. Moving on, back to Guild Wars. Uh, Azu Jack says, In a recent story development, revisiting Guild Wars 1 lore and tying up loose ends, you've often stated that you're satisfied with the conclusion and how things wrap up. Are there any stories or parts of the lore that have had a conclusion you'd like to see come back into focus or given an epilogue? Yeah, this is a really interesting topic to me and I've started to reassess how I feel about things as well. Going into Guild Wars 2, I kind of looked at all the established stuff in GW1 and felt like, yeah, this is all cool stuff, all of this needs to be returned to at some point. These days I wonder whether that's really true, I wonder whether it is possible for something to exist in Guild Wars 2, whether this be a story thing or a mechanical thing, right? And whether it's okay for it to be in the game and never be developed on further. Maybe it's okay to just be there. Right, like think of the Hylic for example and their worship of the sun. Do we need to one day, just because that's a part of Guild Wars 2, does that, is that a loose end? Because they could potentially answer more questions about it? Well, no, not necessarily. Not everything is a loose end. And I think over time I'm coming more and more and more to terms with that fact. Like, Season 3, we saw the White Mantle come back as a big fixture, and they kind of redid the Civil War storyline thing, and now it feels like it's ending again. And uh, it was satisfying, and I'm happy that they did it, but looking back on a whole, the franchise as a whole, did we really need a resurgence of the White Mantle thing? For years, I was desperate to see the White Mantle come back, for years! Uh, but did we really need to do another Civil War type thing? Maybe we didn't in the end, and maybe I only realised that once they did bring it back. Uh, but so on the thought of, hey, is there a real loose end that I definitely do want to see? That I do say, yes, there are loose ends. And probably the biggest one from the later years of Guild Wars 1 is Evinia. Evinia is a really cool character. She's one of my favourite characters from the first game. She was one of the triumvirate leaders of the Shining Blade. One of those members betrayed everyone. One of those members died. One of them was a total badass. That was Evinia. And she was such a huge part of the story of Eye of the North, of the original Prophecies release and then she just disappeared completely disappeared in Guild Wars Beyond no less when they were setting up for the future so we'll have to see what they do there Moving on, we got Eternal Mirage, who says, Hey WP, do you believe Guild Wars 1 should become free to play? While GW1's golden days may have passed, making it F2P could encourage more GW2 players to experience the classic lore and story. Especially now that the six are back in the spotlight, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I'm not sure, obviously, whether going to free-to-play would help ArenaNet in any way. A lot of people ask a similar question, which is, why don't they put GW1 on sales? Are those who are getting Guild Wars 1, are those real diehards in, you know, a fairly niche little section of the um, market? And I think that maybe they've just decided leave it at full price for as long as they can. But I think maybe there is a day where it can go free-to-play, and maybe that day will be the day that the servers go off, if they go off. Now, we've always heard that the GW1 server stuff is kind of running on a small part of the GW2 servers, and there's very little risk of it getting turned off. But ultimately, I mean, God, we've done a lot of speculation today into the far future. That's going to happen, right? And I've always liked the idea of, at that point, 
they kind of release it to uh, the player base to uh, play on locally, maybe even mod and stuff like that. That would be awesome and could be a bit of a resurgence for GW1. And when that happens, maybe that's a point to go free to play. I don't know. Really funny to think about as well. If they ever did announce the end of GW1, like in two months, GW1's ending. At that point, we would have a funny rush of people going back to that game just to enjoy it for as much as they can before that final sad hour. Oh god. And we've seen a lot of MMOs closing down recently, so I have thought about this for the first game, definitely. Next we've got Strider, or V Strider X, who says, Hey WP, is it annoying to constantly have to deal with whispers, in-game mails, and party invites all the time? I wouldn't say it's annoying. Sometimes it can be a bit frustrating. Like, earlier I was trying to do a berry farm. And berry farming on a character that really didn't have great armor or a great build, it can actually be quite a lot of pressure on you from those stupid griffins that are constantly chilling you, or the ice elementals that seal you in blocks and you're getting lower and lower and lower. A lot of people don't stop to res you over there. Uh, so it can be very intensive to just run around and get berries, as silly as that sounds. Um, and somebody started messaging me, talking to me about the guild and how they couldn't stay anymore. And obviously you've got to respond to that. You've got to keep up with people. And it was really difficult to be able to type and then also do what is quite active in Guild Wars 2. And that's always a funny thing. Guild Wars 2's actual gameplay has always been very active compared to much older MMOs where you could be so much more social. So I'd never blame the person for whispering me or I'd never blame a person for mailing me. I've, if anything, I'm incredibly flattered and I enjoy it. But it is a bit at odds with Guild Wars 2 itself. Like if you're raiding, it can be really hard to respond to people. Generally, people are nice though. And I wouldn't say that I'd, I've ever been annoyed by someone sending me messages like that, no. Moving on, for the last question, Leroy Jenkins says, How would you feel if the current events team did an event in one of the Heart of Thorns maps where they used the team swap tool they have to swap Silvari players and turn them into Mordrum to fight other players? It could have rules, uh, but I feel that some kind of interaction like this would, would have given the Heart of Thorns story the impact it was lacking for Silvari players. What do you think? Well, they kind of did do that. That was the first time we saw them use the team swap thing in one of the story instances. We saw it team swapped us on the fly if you were a Silvari character. Do I think that that was enough though? Maybe not. I actually think that technology is really cool and essentially what you're saying is also really cool. Very similar to like the branded event we saw in the betas. But can they do it at this point? No. I think it would have been great, but it would have been great when Heart of Thorns came out and it deserved to be a part of Heart of Thorns. Not all the way out here just before or on the last episode. Uh, I know that we are playing a game that's constantly being updated, but that doesn't mean every update ha is appropriate. And I think the sun has set on that idea. Heart of Thorns didn't tackle the whole can we trust Silvari well enough idea well enough. And now I think that's a missed opportunity. And we'll just have to go along with it and see if that when they bring a storyline like that up again, they'll do it a little bit better. But who knows when that'll be. And well, that is it for the Q&A for today, guys. Thanks again so much for those awesome questions. If you've got any more, or you want to respond to any of these topics, it should be a lot of fun down below. And until next time, I'll see you very soon, guys.